Hi, this is David Shoemaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest Living Thelema segment. Now, this month's topic is going to be meditation and visualization, and this is something of a sequel to the segment I did a few months ago on asana and pranayama, so you might wish to listen to that segment before listening to this one, although that's not really necessary. Um, now, this is another topic that was suggested via some Facebook fans, so uh, thank you very much for keeping the suggestions coming. I really do appreciate it, and as you can see, over the past few months, we've actually uh, used quite a bit of your of your suggestions, so I, I really do appreciate it. Now, um, let's start with basic meditation, and I should emphasize this will be basic meditation. Naturally, um, meditation, like many of the topics we cover, uh, has a huge continuum of practice, and um, it's something that is very likely to be a basic practice, but it's also very likely to be a practice that um, one carries through to the highest levels of attainment, just uh, taking very different forms. Now, typically, when we speak about meditation in a thelemic context, and especially if we're discussing it in the context of the curriculum of AA, um, we're going to be focusing on Raja Yoga style meditation. Um, but you'll see from the discussion today that there's a lot of other options open to you. Some, uh, even within the traditional AA curriculum, uh, rely more on Buddhist techniques, and some are entirely um, almost proto-guided imagery techniques uh, that, uh, that Crowley created for the work of AA. So kind of a grab bag, but let's start with the classic uh, stages of meditation that we find in Raja Yoga. This begins with the process of concentration uh, called dharana. And when this is sustained and there is a successful result, we begin to have what is called dhyana, which is known as the union of subject and object, um, the, the ego and the non-ego, or the, uh, the observer and the observed, etc. You have some form of union um, experience with the object of your meditation, basically. We also, in the course of improving our ability to meditate, obtain more control over the mind. Uh, this is known as pratyahara. And finally, all these techniques uh, can ultimately lead to the result we call samadhi, which um, is a transcendent state of consciousness that is really beyond rational description um, as we understand it. But uh, since basic practice begins with Dharana, that's what we're going to focus mostly on today, um, concentration practices. It really is the bread and butter of daily practice and is likely to be so for weeks and months before uh, other stages typically occur. Um, I've discussed in previous segments the process of setting up a basic magical regimen, and Dharana or concentration practices are certainly likely to be a part of that. In relation to AA, you'll note that the probationer even at this very beginning level as probationer, is likely to do quite a bit of experimentation with dharana, along with asana and pranayama. You can look in uh, Liber E, Crowley's Liber E, for these basic instructions. In uh, the neophyte and zealotor grades, there is work with some guided meditations known as MMM and AAA. Uh, essentially, these are like guided imagery exercises based on the initiatory formula of those grades. It's kind of a means of deepening the aspirant's understanding of these formula and accelerating their action. Uh, the practicus works with Liberturis, which is a very challenging but powerful practice in control of thought. Liber Ugorum is a form of control over thought, word, and deed uh, akin to uh, some Raja Yoga techniques that uh, is worked with in the AA across several grades. And um, the whole process is brought to a point, a single point of focus at the Dominus Luminous grade. And uh, you'll see on the Dominus Luminous task paper, um, he shall meditate on the diverse knowledge and power that he has acquired and harmonize it perfectly. In other words, the climax of all this Raja Yoga that has gone before is that the, the one-pointed focus of the mind, the meditation, literally becomes a living meditation um, in our day-to-day -day lives on the synthesis of the elemental grades and all that they represent 
inside the aspirant at this point of the path. So that's really the the whole arc of practice of meditation as we see across the first order grades of AA and in all its um, different forms. But um, as I said, it all begins with daily basic concentration practices, dharana. So let's bring it back to that and let me give you some practical tips on executing this. Now, um, as I said, you know, you, you may have heard my, my asana and pranayama segment, I'm focusing specifically on the role of asana in preparing one for concentration practices here. Um, the, the point of asana, one of the main points of asana, is simply to attain skill in keeping the body still and, importantly, in allowing the mind to ignore stimuli coming from the body. In other words, we set ourselves up so that we are less likely to be distracted by stimuli from the body so that we can better keep our focus on whatever we are choosing to do our meditation on. Makes sense. So um, you're going to find, certainly, that if you undertake concentration practices, the more able you are to ignore bodily sensation at the time of doing the practice, um, probably the more effective the practice will be just as much as you want to ignore any other sort of stimuli if you're trying to focus on a particular thing. So um, some preliminary work with asana, you know, is, is probably useful here. Um, the basic concentration practice is a self-discipline practice. It's a discipline of the mind to stay focused on the intended object of meditation, whether that be an object, a, a visualized object, um, or a... Um, or the breath, or um, a mantra, something like that. But in any case, with the basic practice here, the goal is not to let the mind wander off and think about whatever, um, you know, twists and turns may come out of the original object of meditation. It's not, it's not the point here to elaborate your understanding of what a red triangle is, you know, or, or get all uh, cosmic and have uh, visions of, of things. The basic point here is, is simply to train the mind to be still and to stay focused. And so you want to um, have some quantitative sense of how you're doing at that, and that's why Crowley um, recommends that you count your breaks of meditation. In other words, you count breaks of concentration from the focus. And um, by counting these, you get some sort of ability to track yourself, your, you know, track your progress as you work on it. So one of the easiest ways to do this, and you can count up to 25 breaks this way, is to use your hands, use the fingers on your hands, so that, say, for example, the left hand is uh, single breaks. You're counting up to five single breaks. As soon as you hit five breaks on that hand, you put down one finger on the other hand. And... Repeat. So then you get another five on the left hand, and you have a second finger down on the right hand. So you know you've had ten breaks. So as I said, you can count up to 25 breaks this way. If you get past 25 breaks, just put it down as a bad session, and uh, you know don't worry about uh, counting past that too much. But uh, a simple method there of keeping track of things. As a self-discipline enhancing practice, another aspect of that is you want to sit down with a specified goal in terms of the amount of time you're going to spend on meditation. You want to train your mind to listen to your will, to your intention when it comes to anything. But in this instance, you're telling those uh, more attention deficit prone aspects of your of your mind that we're going to sit here for 20 minutes or whatever it is, and we're not going to stop this practice until we've spent 20 minutes working on it. So Crowley says in, in one or two places, and I'm paraphrasing here, that it would be far better to do 20 minutes exactly because you said you would of really lousy practice than it would to do 19 minutes of incredible practice but stop a minute early. Um, now, granted, that's for this stage of training, where the whole point is the self-discipline of the practice. But uh, his point is well taken, that uh, you really want to give yourself 
the gift of the self-discipline that will arise when you don't let yourself stop early, when you keep your vigilance and you keep your, uh, your, uh, your word to yourself, essentially. That will translate in a very positive way into other aspects of fulfilling your will and not letting your ego intrude or interrupt or be an obstacle to your will. It's very important that your attitude toward meditation is one of allowing the mind to be still rather than forcing it to be still. Much like you can't lie in bed and force yourself to go to sleep. You, you don't, uh, you know, sleeping is not a, an active act um, in terms of initiating it. It's, it's a passive one where you allow the mental control that keeps you vigilant and alert to be relaxed. So similarly, here you're relaxing that control in order to allow stillness of the mind. And along these lines, your attitude towards yourself during the practice should be uh, probably on the gentle side rather than on the, the punitive side. Um, that's that just ends up being a distraction from meditation if you're, you know, cursing at yourself for letting your mind wander. If your mind wanders for any of these practices, whether it's visualization or mantra or breath awareness, whatever, um, simply. Think of it like a cloud passing over the sun and you're just drawing your attention back to the focus of your meditation. Um, there's no need to, uh, to abuse yourself in the process. So um, let's start with uh, one example of a style of meditation, and that would be uh, with a visual focus, a visualized object. Um, classically, you might choose one of the tattvas, um, such as the red equilateral triangle. And um, you'll notice as you start to try to focus on this, you can replicate this within 60 seconds if you try it right now, you'll notice that the mind will play all sorts of tricks on you quite likely within a, a few minutes of starting such a practice. The image will jump around, change color, uh, assume ridiculous proportions, get out of the shape it's supposed to be in, uh, all kinds of stuff. And here again, I encourage you in terms of dealing with these phenomena, uh, rather than tightening down on it, clenching on it, and being upset about it, and so on, I encourage you to soften around it. Allow the jumping around or the color change or whatever it is to pass and simply uh, allow the basic image to be. And I think you'll find that, that over time, this is a much more effective way to get yourself into some quality and lengthy meditations on uh, images. So uh, you would focus on the image for a set period of time, uh, count your breaks, and uh, record the other conditions of the experiment, such as um, how much food you had in your stomach, how tired you were, perhaps what the weather was like, the physical conditions of your meditation room, any um, psychological disturbances that might form a form the sort of um, mental set that you had going into the exercise and so on. Uh, another type of meditation you might try is mantra meditation. And um, what I tend to recommend for this is a silent mantra that is done rhythmically, such as uh, you can choose a phrase like Rahul Kweet, and you would do this rhythmically um, and in a sustained, unbroken fashion, and count your breaks from that uh, from that that rhythm. So, for example, it might sound like this: Ra hur quit, Ra hur quit, Ra hur quit, and so on. You'll notice I was inserting a pause there of basically the same length as one of the syllables. So um, you're on a consistent rhythm, and um, you know, just, just try that for the specified period of time. Now, naturally, that, as I said, this would be silent. So in order to demonstrate it, I kind of have to say it out loud. But uh, this would be silent meditation on the mantra. Um, any mantra will work, but uh, you probably want to choose something that you feel in harmony with and that you uh, would not mind uh, yourself uniting with in terms of uh, advanced meditation result. Now, another type of practice would be breath awareness. This could be as simple as uh, simply focusing on the fourfold breathing pattern that um, you know you find described in, in some basic texts by Rigardi and others. 
Um, you simply have a, a consistent count on the in-breath, hold, out-breath, hold, and so on. Um, now, the key with this sort of practice is that you, you don't go too slow. You don't set yourself up to get out of breath by starting that pace too slow. And also don't link it to your heartbeat because as you get more relaxed, your heart rate will slow down. And then you'll find that you're out of breath because you're trying to breathe too slowly. So um, it will be fairly brisk. About the same pace as the Rahu Kweet mantra I demonstrated um, might work as a starting place to kind of see how that goes for you. So each... In breath would be about as long as it took me to say ra, hur, quit, pause, etc. And uh, the out breath and the holding times would be the same. Um, a more advanced but really powerful breathing awareness technique is called uh, Mahasatipatana. And this is a um, technique that, that Crowley describes in a couple places. Um, it is simply observation of the passage of the breath. And a mantra, it's, well, it's not exactly a mantra, but it's, a, it's an inward statement of noticing um, based on your observation. It actually should not devolve into a sing-songy mantra. Uh, it should remain an active observation. For example, you, you start simply witnessing your breath, natural rate, natural depth. And each time you breathe in, you would say, the breath moves in. Each time you breathe out, you would say, the breath moves out. And these would be silent statements. Now, the interesting thing here is that as you progress with this, your results will um, typically show a progressive disidentification with ego, with your, your basic ego identity. Um, your everyday waking identity. And that's one of the really cool things about this practice. For example, you might go from simply saying the breath is moving in, the breath is moving out, to noticing that what you're actually observing is that there is a sensation that the breath is moving in. There is a sensation that the breath is moving out. Then you might discover that what you're actually noticing is that there is a perception of a sensation that the breath is moving in and there is a perception of a sensation that the breath is moving out. So you change what you're saying silently to yourself based on what you're actually noticing. And if you follow that train of thought and that train of results, you get to some very interesting places, and I don't want to spoil it for you by kind of front-loading your experience of it, but see what happens if you practice with that for at least 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, it takes a while to get, get rolling with it and on a repeated basis. Um, See what you get in, in terms of that ego disidentification process. It also, of course, has the same self-discipline benefits of all these other meditation styles I've been talking about in terms of uh, holding yourself to an intended period of time and keeping mental focus, and you can certainly count your breaks if you wish um, for this practice. Now, earlier I mentioned that uh, the practicus of AA begins experimenting with Liber Turis which um, indeed is a very, very powerful practice. Um, I thought it might be useful to read the basic instructions from Liber Turis here uh, so you get a sense of uh, a very different style of practice that, that he's shooting for here. Um, it's, it's often been said, and certainly I found it true, and, and students I've observed, I've found it true in their work, that it's really hard to just get the mind to stop. It's much easier and this is why the basic practices revolve around this, it's much easier to get the mind to focus on one thing and hold that focus. Um, a more advanced practice, however, as in Libra Turis, is actually stopping thought itself. And um, so I thought you might enjoy hearing these instructions if you're not familiar with this text. So here we go with uh, Libra Turis. This practice is very difficult. The student cannot hope for much success unless he have thoroughly mastered asana, and obtained much definite success in the meditation practices of Lieber E and Lieber HHH. On the other hand, any success in this practice is of an exceedingly high character, and the student is less liable to, to illusion and self-deception in this than in almost any other that we make known. First point, the student should discover for himself the apparent position of the point in his brain where thoughts arise, if there be such a point. If not, 
he should seek the position of the point where thoughts are judged. Second point, he must also develop in himself a will of destruction, even a will of annihilation. It may be that this shall be discovered at an immeasurable distance from his physical body. Nevertheless, this he must reach. With this he must identify himself, even to the loss of himself. Third point. Let this will then watch vigilantly the point where thoughts arise, or the point where they are judged, and let every thought be annihilated as it is perceived or judged. Fourth point. Next, let every thought be inhibited in its inception. Fifth point. Next, let even the causes or tendencies that if unchecked ultimate in thoughts be discovered and annihilated. Sixth and last point. Let the true cause of all be unmasked and annihilated. This is that which was spoken by the wise men of old time concerning the destruction of the world by fire. Yea, the destruction of the world by fire. Let the student remember that each point represents a definite achievement of great difficulty. So, there's more to the Lieber, but uh, those are the basic instructions. And... Um, it's uh, it's some interesting work if you want to give that a shot. Um, now, that's the basics of some meditation styles. I want to move on to um, visualization, which is uh, another aspect of what we're going to talk about today. Um, here we're talking about visualization in a slightly different sense than simply conceiving of a red triangle and meditating on it. We're talking about something a little more active, a little more akin actually to what we think of today in modern psychotherapeutic circles as guided imagery exercises or also um, akin to Carl Jung's process he called active imagination where one uh, sort of has a waking dream encounter uh, interaction with the unconscious. So for this reason I've put um, Robert Johnson's book called Inner Work back on the resources list for this podcast because that's got an excellent uh, point by point discussion of active imagination on there. But um, one thing you'll notice in the AA curriculum is that Crowley's done something interesting here in regard to these visualization practices. He's had the, uh, he set it up so that the neophyte and the zealotor essentially do guided imagery exercises on the initiatory formulae of those grades. And those exercises are found in Libra HHH, sections MMM and AAA. Those correspond to the neophyte and zealotor formulae, um, respectively. I'm going to read from MMM, and um, you know you might find this another one uh, that's interesting to to work with. I suggest if you're going to do this, you might start by recording yourself, talking yourself through the things you're supposed to be visualizing and working on, because um, it's obviously. Um, a little bit disruptive to be trying to take yourself through a visualization and glancing over at a written page to remind yourself of what the next thing is. Um, of course, you know, ideally you would have memorized the whole process, but uh, to get started with it, you might record something and take yourself through. Um, this is a little bit like self-hypnosis, too. And that's, that's another podcast. Um, so here's MMM. Be seated in Dhyanasana wearing the robe of a neophyte, the hood drawn. It is night, heavy and hot. There are no stars. Not one breath of wind stirs the surface of the sea. That is thou. No fish play in the depths. Let a breath rise and ruffle the waters. This also thou shalt feel playing upon thy skin. It will disturb thy meditation twice or thrice, after which thou shouldst have conquered this distraction. But unless thou first feel it, that breath hath not arisen. Next, the night is riven by the lightning flash. This also shalt thou feel in thy body, which shall shiver and leap with the shock. And that also must be both suffered and overcome. After the lightning flash, resteth in the zenith a minute point of light. And that light shall radiate until a right cone be established upon the sea, and it is day. 
With this thy body shall be rigid automatically, and this shalt thou let endure, withdrawing thyself into thine heart in the form of an upright egg of blackness, and therein shalt thou abide for a space. When all this is perfectly and easily performed at will, let the aspirant figure to himself a struggle with the whole force of the universe. In this he is only saved by his minuteness. But in the end he is overcome by death, who covers him with a black cross. Let his body fall supine with arms outstretched. So lying, let him aspire fervently unto the holy guardian angel. Now let him resume his former posture. Two and twenty times shall he figure to himself that he is bitten by a serpent, feeling even in his body the poison thereof. And let each bite be healed by an eagle or hawk, spreading its wings above his head and dropping thereupon a healing dew. But let the last bite be so terrible a pang at the nape of the neck that he seemeth to die. And let the healing dew be of such virtue that he leapeth to his feet. Let there now be placed within his egg a red cross, then a green cross, then a golden cross, then a silver cross, or those things which these shadow forth. Herein is silence, for he that hath rightly performed the meditation will understand the inner meaning thereof, and it shall serve as a test of himself and his fellows. Let him now remain in the pyramid or cone of light, as an egg, but no more of blackness. Then let his body be in the position of the hanged man, and let him aspire with all his force unto the holy guardian angel. The grace having been granted unto him, let him partake mystically of the Eucharist of the five elements, and let him proclaim light in extension. Yea, let him proclaim light in extension. So those of you familiar with the formula uh, used in Libra Pyramidos and elsewhere, which ties in with this neophyte formula, will easily see some correlations there in terms of what's being visualized and what happens in those rituals. But um, experiment with this. Record it. Take yourself through it. See, uh, see what you get. It will take certainly multiple trials to uh, get the most results out of it, and your own level of initiation will naturally affect... Um, how far you find yourself able to, to go. Now, uh, a couple other suggestions for other kinds of visualizations or imagery exercises that you can do. Um, we'll do something more in-depth in a later podcast here in terms of um, um, getting you into um, a receptive state uh, along the lines of self-hypnosis or, or deep relaxation. Um, and then uh, working with some sort of visualization. But let's assume for the time being that you're able to sit still, relax, clear your mind, settle into rhythmic breathing, and visualize some stuff. So here's some suggestions on what you could visualize. Um, one thing very effective for many people is to, uh, once you're into a deep relaxation, you go, say, down a path into the forest, and you... Visualize um, what you're conceiving of as your inner teacher coming toward you. Now, you could see this as kind of a, a glimmer of the Holy Guardian Angel, however you like. But at any, in any case, it's, it's an inner teacher that you have confidence in. And this teacher approaches and you ask the teacher for a symbol, a word, a teaching, um, some sort of, of observable, experienced action that will be an important message for you. So it's like an inner divination, essentially, using visualizations. Um, another exercise that uh, I've used quite a bit, I've used this with, with my patients and with my students as well, is to do a sequence of visualizations of all the forms of love you have experienced, um, to um, build in yourself a sense of your vast capacity for experiencing love and actually generating all of those feelings yourself um, autonomously. So you would go through a series of visualizations where you tried to um, tap in as viscerally as possible to the hug you might receive from a loved one, um, the hug of a parent, the 
the laughter of a child, the uh, the embrace of a lover, all these different forms of love, uh, even even inanimate things like uh, um, kind of falling in love with a beautiful sunset on a particularly impressive uh, day, um, things like that. So just take yourself through that sequence and um, build up those feelings inwardly and, and try to, to lock that in and, and hold on to that. Uh, another thing you can try is, along the lines of the divination kind of idea here, is you can uh, visualize that you're going down into the, the recesses of your mind, you know, go down into a deep tunnel or down an elevator or something, you know, whatever visual device works for you downstairs uh, often works. Um, and um, there you discover this treasure chamber and there's a, a chest which you open and you know that you're going to find three objects within and each of these objects which may be something familiar or unfamiliar to you are going to have a particular teaching for you about um, your growth stage um, you know it might be a suggestion to overcome an obstacle it might be something that gives you insights into where you're at with things but you just very mindfully choose these objects take note of what they are come out of the meditation and uh, later, um, you know, actually you can do this within the meditation or later, kind of uh, do some further um, pondering of what these symbols might mean to you. And, of course, put the details in your diary. Finally, um, there's something that we call the affect bridge technique. And this is especially useful if you're finding disturbing emotions coming up that you seem to, you can't necessarily pinpoint the source of them. Uh, it feels intense, maybe out of proportion with the, the present day sources of, of stress or, or um, problems. So you visualize yourself um, once you're relaxed, you know, you, you see yourself standing in front of a bridge and you know that this bridge takes you from the feeling you're experiencing now, whatever this troublesome feeling is, this bridge will take you to the source of that feeling um, in your past. So you might find yourself coming back to a scene where you experienced uh, the same emotion in the context of a parental interaction when you were small or something along those lines. Um, just a way of kind of breaking through the, the conscious control that the ego tends to exert and breaking through the limitations of uh, present day into, uh, into deeper memory storage, if you will. Okay, so that's um, the, the podcast for today. I hope you found some useful techniques here. Obviously, um, as I've said a couple times today, there's areas we can and will expand on in future segments. Um, but this will uh, will get you started. Uh, thanks again for the feedback that led to this particular episode. And I want to encourage you to... Uh, uh, please do email or uh, post on Facebook with uh, other suggestions and comments that you have. You can contact me via email at livingthelema at me.com. That's M-E dot com. And at livingthelema dot com, you will find um, the usual uh, list of resources and my bio and other contact info there. Um, visit us on Facebook as well and on the Speech in the Silence YouTube channel. But uh, thanks very much for listening again. I look forward to talking to you next time.